I was asked to say a few things about Washington. I've been in Congress for 16 months now, and I appreciate the opportunity to be your United States Representative. Uh, I, I will say this, I really like President Trump. I, I support the President's agenda. I think that uh, from a business standpoint, from the things that the people in this room care about, I think we're on the right track. I'm going to talk about a few things that have, have been accomplished, I think, are leading to uh, what we heard today on the news, we've got the, the lowest unemployment rate in 17 years, the economy's growing, uh, things are, things are, I think, headed in the right direction from a business climate standpoint. So, but, uh, but having said that, you know, you watch the news and we're talking about Russia every day, about Stormy Daniels and all this stuff, but that's really not mentioned in, in Washington. The, the media's a lot more, um, obsessed with it than I think the, the average congressman the, than the average uh, business leader in America. So it's something that, uh, you know, it, it, it consumes a lot of time on television, but I do think more things are getting done than, than what's being reported on the news. I'm going to mention a few things that I think have helped grow the economy in America. First of all, from the time that the president took office and when I started in Congress, we really focused on reducing the regulatory burden in America. Uh, I feel like that was one of the things when I was campaigning for Congress for, that was a 15 month campaign for me. When I was talking to business people and listening to their concerns, you know, what, what's, your, what's your biggest concern in Washington? It really wasn't taxes, it was the regulatory environment. Uh, whether you're in the financial services industry, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're in manufacturing, uh, agriculture, whatever industry you were involved in, the regulations that were coming out of Washington over the last eight to 10 years and it had been really excessive. So we've tried to go in and we've passed bills called the Congressional Review Act. We, we've done things to try to roll back some of the burdens of unnecessary regulations. We haven't eliminated every regulation because you have to have some regulations or you're gonna have bad actors that are gonna pollute and do things like that, uh, mistreat their workers and all that. But from a, from a common sense standpoint, I really think that we've gone through just about every industry and tried to roll back the, the regulations that were holding us back, that were holding the private sector back. So it seems like uh, from the time that started and the, and the, roll, and the regulations started rolling back, we, we saw uh, the stock market respond, the stock market was, was going up there for, for a pretty good period of time. Then we, at the end of December, at the end of the year, in December, we passed a major tax reform that significantly reduced the individual tax rate and the corporate tax rate. And one thing I always want to mention is, again, going back to what you see sometimes on, on television, they say, well, it was only a tax cut for the rich. I want to relay a very interesting statistic about our congressional district. I think most of you know how the lines are drawn. You have to be really creative and, uh, to, to, to draw a congressional district with Lebanon, Kentucky, and Paducah, Kentucky in the same congressional district. But that's the way it is, and uh, I, I love the congressional district. But in our congressional district, 35 counties in central Kentucky, southern Kentucky, and western Kentucky, 35 counties, 81% of the people, when they file taxes, take the standard deduction. 81%. That's one of the highest in, in the nation. So, the, so you know, there's... They're not going to a, a, a an accountant and, and you know, itemizing their deductions or anything like that. They're just taking the standard deduction. And before this tax reform bill, the standard deduction for a married couple was twelve thousand dollars. We we moved that to twenty four thousand dollars. That, that's a significant and lowered the rate. So that's a significant tax cut for eighty one percent of the people in the first congressional district. Then you throw in what we did with the top rates and with the corporations and the business taxes, the LLCs. I mean, it, it, it was a pretty significant tax cut. So I think that's something that uh, I've heard a couple of business owners today say, you know, that's had a positive effect on their businesses. They're gonna invest more uh, in, in new equipment. They're gonna expand, they're gonna hire more people. And that's something that was the goal of the, of the tax cuts, trying to return more money to the people that are taking risks and working hard every day. But, you know, at the same time, my criticism of it is when you cut revenue, you have to cut spending, too, or you're going to run the deficit up. And my, my uh, criticism 
one of many of my criticisms of Congress is I don't think people in either party are taking the, the federal debt serious enough. I mean, it's, it's over $20 trillion. Uh, you know it's going to be a lot more next year when I operate the deficit next year because we reduce the revenue. But instead of reducing spending, Congress increased spending. And you cannot continue down that path. That is an unsustainable path that uh, I'm trying to do something about because I believe that we have to have a balanced budget amendment. If you don't force Congress to balance the budget, they're not going to balance the budget. I've been there long enough to tell you. They're not, they may come home and talk about it, but they're not going to do it when it comes right down to it. So that's something that, I, that I'm serious about. Hopefully we can get unnecessary spending under control in America because it is, it is out of control. But from a business climate standpoint, I think we've done some things from regula regulatory standpoint to a uh, uh, tax rate standpoint that I think has, has helped the businesses. You know, the the uh, the one negative thing about the report that they said there weren't as many jobs created as they had hoped. But I think the problem is there it wasn't the economy just can't find enough workers. And every business that I talked to, every big employer in the first congressional district says, you know, we, we've got job openings now, we just can't find the people to fill those jobs. Which brings me into what I wanted to mention today, the major legislation that I've been working on in the 16 months since I've been in Congress, is the farm bill. I think uh, Jimmy mentioned I was Commissioner of Agriculture before I came here. In the private sector, I have a big farming operation. So that's the industry that I'm most identified with, and it's something that I've, you know, there, there's so few farmers in Congress, they stuck me on the Agriculture Committee when I got there, which I'm, I'm fine with that. But uh, every five years, Congress passes a farm bill, and it's this year. So it's something that I've been working on it for, for 16 months. We've had committee hearings. Uh, every commodity group in, in, in America comes to my office, I think, when they're, when they're in Washington. And just Again, there's so few members of Congress that, that have any type of agriculture background. So we're doing something different with this farm bill, and you know, again, there's been some criticism about it. But when you look at the farm bill, about a fourth of it is agriculture. Three fourths of it is food. So your your uh, school nutrition program in your in your public schools that comes out of the farm bill. Your SNAP benefits, uh, what we used to call food stamps, that comes out of the farm bill. So there are a lot of things in the farm bill. That, that aren't just the typical federal crop insurance and funding for the University of Kentucky and the land grant schools and things like that. There, there's a lot about food. But one of the things that we're wanting to do is take advantage of this strong economy by reforming our welfare system in America. Again, as I mentioned earlier, every big employer in my district and every big employer that I've talked to in Kentucky complains about not being able to find work. Uh, I think the, this administration's had, done a good job in Washington securing the, the border. We don't have as many uh, people crossing the border illegally, but that's had a, uh, that had a negative effect because it's created an even bigger shortage of workers for certain jobs. So there's never been a better time in America to get people that are able-bodied, if they're able-bodied, off welfare and into the work. So what we've done with the, with the food stamp program, with the SNAP program, is we uh, uh, have proposed a work requirement on able-bodied individuals, not children, not the elderly, not people that, that have disabilities, but able-bodied people that, that receive SNAP benefits to work 20 hours a week. And not just put that mandate on there, but also put funding in there for worker training. Because I know in Monroe County, and I use Monroe County a lot because I can, and that's where I'm from, and I know just about everybody in the county. We're seeing now third and fourth generation that they, for whatever reason, they can't break this cycle, this cycle of poverty and this cycle of government dependence. And many of them are able bodied but they really don't have any skills. You know, for, for, through no fault of their own, they were probably raised, this is what you do to take advantage, you know, you don't want to. This is, this is uh, you know, you can get free health care, free housing, free food. And I think that now we, we've looked at, if you look at poverty over the last 30 years, the government programs in the counties and communities that are most dependent on the government programs, their poverty 
level continuous temperatures, they're not like Marion County. They don't roll their sleeves up like, like you all have and recruited industry and, and retain the industry that you have here. Uh, they've just kind of been waiting for the, for the government to come in and, and provide safety nets for them. So what we're doing is trying to pr provide uh, worker training dollars, skills, work with our schools, with our KCTCSs, work with workforce development, uh, whomever we can to try to teach basic skills if they need basic skill education to try to help people get out of poverty and get into the workforce. And, and that's a win for the taxpayers. If that happens, that's a win for the taxpayers. That's a win for the businesses that are looking for more workers. And I think it's a win for those families that are, that are in this poverty cycle. So the, the farm bill is something that you're going to be reading a lot more about over the next few months. September 30th is the, the deadline for the last farm bill. So I, I've learned too, Jimmy, in, in, in Washington, they went to the last minute on everything. So through the summer and especially in early fall, you'll be seeing a lot of battles and a lot of debate over the farm bill. Uh, when you see talk, the, the president or, or someone talking about welfare reform, the first plank of welfare reform is going to be on the, on the farm bill. And I know we have a lot of uh, people involved in agriculture in here. I think it's a good farm bill for agriculture. I think it's it's something that uh, helps just about every commodity. I know we have some, uh, some people interested in dairy in here. The dairy industry is probably, uh, of all the agricultural commodities, the world uh, that's in most peril today. It's just a tough industry right now. The, the prices and the market situation there. Uh, we're, we're, we've addressed dairy in the farm bill. I don't know if it's going to be enough. We work closely with the dairy group, so I wanted to, to, to mention that. But uh, I, I will, I'll wrap it up and then open it up for questions with this. I, I think that we're going to see over the next few months uh, efforts not only for welfare reform in Washington, I also think you're going to see uh, a, a major immigration bill pass. There's a bill in Congress, and I would love to hear your uh, your thoughts on it, you can email or call or, or contact our, our team here. But uh, it's called the Good Lap Bill. It's kind of a compromise. I know that, that sounds funny coming from Washington. It's, it's a compromise bill uh, with, with business, with agriculture, uh, with our judiciary, uh, with law enforcement, uh, with, with uh, faith-based groups. It, it's, everybody came together to try to come up with a common sense immigration proposal. It's something that, that I really think is a good bill, but uh, if you have a problem with it, I, I would love to hear from you. And uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, trade is always a major issue. The, the president, I think everyone knows, has put the steel and aluminum tariffs on. I'll give you an example. They, they, they look at my district, and along the Ohio River, you have a lot of steel and aluminum mills. And people assume, well, I guess your district was for the tariffs. That's not true. One business in my district that supported the tariff. That would be Century Aluminum. No secret. They're very vocal about it. They're a great corporate citizen. They employ about 1,000 people in my district and 1,000 people in Greg Upfree's district. But every other aluminum and steel maker, is adamantly opposed to it. You know, you've got Tartar Gate, all the steel they, they consume on up the road, that comes from China. Stevens Pipe and Steel in Russell County, everything they use comes from Indonesia. They, those countries were affected by the tariffs and it's disrupted the, the, the entire market. I have Logan Aluminum in Russellville, which they make aluminum cans, mainly for Budweiser. Budweiser announced they're probably gonna shift aluminum production to Mexico and they're gonna to go to more models if something's not fixed on this tariff situation real quick. So the, the, uh, the, steel and the, the tariffs for steel and aluminum have been very unpopular in my district. And it's also given great concern to two major industries in Marion County, the agriculture industry and the bourbon industry. Because when you, when you start talking about a trade war and you see the things at the top of the list that other countries are, are talking about retaliating and putting tariffs on, uh, agriculture commodities and, and bourbon were, were at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to Maker's Mark when I leave here. We were uh, at the bourbon barrel uh, factory before we, we came over here today and just listening to our, our industry, it's amazing what you all have done with tourism here. Uh, you have you know, some great facilities here. <laughs> 
and it, it's really amazing that the tourism that's generating in, in, generated in Kentucky through the Bourbon Trail. I want to make sure that nothing disrupts that. So I'm really uh, a, kind of a critic of the of the tariff situation right now. I understand that China has has kind of taken advantage of the United States in a lot of areas of manufacturing, and I, I appreciate that that the president's trying to do something. But I think it's, we're going down a slippery slope there with, with trade. We, we have a lot to lose in my district if, if we are engaged in a trade war. So I'm hopeful that uh, this administration has some good negotiators that are negotiating with China right now. And they are in constant meetings right now, the, the trade representatives and uh, Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue and, and the Mnuchin's over there right now, the Treasury Secretary, they're trying to do everything they can to make sure that we don't get engaged in a, in a trade war that I think would be detrimental in the short term for, for our congressional district. So we're, we're trying to stay on top of that, and I'm still focused on trying to reduce wasteful spending and improve the, the business climate in America. So with that, Tom, I said I'd open it up for questions. If you may have any questions or complaints. Or you're going to build a wall? You're going to build a wall? That's a great question. You don't beat around the bush, dude. <laughs> problems that, that's in Congress. I tell people the biggest problem with Congress is there are too many congressmen. That's the biggest problem. 435 representatives and 100 senators. Kentucky has six representatives and obviously two senators. But for a bill to come along, it has to pass the House and the Senate. And then the President signed it into law. Just like in Frankfurt, it has to pass the House and the Senate and the Governor signed it into law. The difference in Frankfurt and Washington is majority approves the bill in the House, it passes. A majority approves the bill in the Senate, it passes. And then the governor gets it. In Washington, that's not the case. In the House where I am, 435 people, a majority, 218, it passes. The Senate, it takes 60 votes out of 100, a super majority. There's where the problem is. The 51 Republicans and 49 Democrats, and they're voting party line on everything. You are a long way from 60, a long way. So we had, what you're supposed to do in the budget process, there's 12 appropriations bills that you're supposed to pass individually. We did that in the House of Representatives. Uh, there's an agriculture bill, there's a Department of Defense bill. There is a Homeland Security bill. And in the Homeland Security bill that we passed, that I voted for, it funded about 40% of the president's southern border wall. It's very controversial, and a lot of uh, a lot of people either were 100% for it or 100% against it. Wasn't any middle ground on it. But that was in the Homeland Security Bill that I voted for. So I voted to pay for a big part of the southern wall. That bill wouldn't have gotten 45 votes in the Senate. So instead of passing 12 individual appropriations bills in the Senate like they were supposed to, they loved everything in a bill, a big old gigantic bill, and it was called the Omnibus Bill. You probably heard about that. And I voted against it because it's going to run the, the deficit up to a record amount for over the next 12 months. And it, you know, there were some good things in it, but I'm serious about trying to not spend more than we take in. But the wall is obviously a priority for the president. I support that. I mean, I, when I campaigned, I, I said I would support that. But uh, I, will, I do think, even though the wall hasn't been built, that there's been great progress on securing the border. Now in the news are all those people, you know, that are trying to migrate to the United States. And I think, it's, I think we should provide humanitarian relief for those people, but we don't have to bring them in the United States. We certainly don't have to put them in sanctuary cities around the United States. Uh, but I do believe that we can provide humanitarian relief for them over there and try to help them over there without bringing them in and making them uh, American citizens. They can certainly apply. There's a process, there's a legal process to do that. But right now, I do, to answer your question, I do not think the United States Senate can pass anything that funds that report. Thank you. And I can tell Who's for the wall and who's against it, brother? The looks I get. Any other? Yes, sir. What's being done in Washington with the opioid problem? The opioid? Yeah, that's, a, that's in the 
obviously it's one of the major issues when you talk about the improving the business climate. You know, the, the, the biggest problem the employers have no one I can't find employees and then the, well, I can't find employees that can pass the, the drug test. So the opioid issue is, is is huge. It's getting bigger every day. It's getting worse every day. Senator McConnell's been giving a lot of speeches this week. Congress is out of session this week. He's been uh, talking about that. That's been his focus. He says the Senate's going to come with legislation in the next few weeks uh, to try to address the problem, provide more funding, more funding for uh, recovery. Uh, we're trying to work, and, and you know, there's enough data coming in now to figure out which recovery programs are, are working, which uh, recovery programs are the are the the, the best deal for the taxpayers essentially and you're going to see more more programs for that uh, trying to put more restrictions on on pain on pain pills uh, i'm sympathetic i know there are people that are in pain that have trouble getting their prescriptions filled now but i believe we have to have alternative sources of pain relief so i, I think that we, we need to look at and, and, and try to distribute more more information more data you know chiropractors, physical therapists, I think industrial health, something that, that uh, Jimmy mentioned that I championed when I was in the uh, Department of Agriculture. You, you've got a lot of manufacturers in Kentucky that are processing this hemp and it's non-addictive. It's not for marijuana, it's non-THC hemp that can treat pain with the, with the cannabidiol oil product. If you go to any of the local pharmacies here, they all sell that product. It's, it's not a ph pharmaceutical, it's a nutraceutical. And it's really uh, helping a lot of people, especially younger people. So I think that there are alternative sources of pain relief, alternative ways to treat pain. And, and I think through our healthcare system in America, we're going to have to try to drastically change how we're trying to help treat pain in America, uh, trying to also get the pain pill mill operation shut down. and, and uh, provide a lot of funding for recovery. So that's what's going to be hopefully passed out of Washington in the next four weeks. But McConnell's been talking a lot about it this week. Any other questions?